Good afternoon and welcome to the third part of our, three, our latest three-part webinar series on construction contracts. This webinar shall focus on limiting liability. In particular, we will look at the different forms that limits on liability can take and the various constraints on the use of such clauses. Before we begin, there are a few housekeeping matters to address. To minimise background noise, I have placed you all on mute. If you would like to ask questions, please do so using the webinar chat function. In order to keep within the 30 minutes, we will be answering as many questions as we can at the end of the presentation, rather than as we go along. I am Lisa Alexander and I work in the Construction Disputes team specialising in construction and engineering dispute resolution based in Edinburgh. I am joined by Kirstine Milne, who is a senior associate in the Construction and Special Projects team, specialising in non-contentious construction and engineering contracts. Both Kirstine and I regularly advise on construction matters across a range of projects and clients, whether acting for private sector developers, public sector, consultants or contractors. We therefore have a great deal of experience advising in circumstances where contractors are looking to limit their liability under construction contracts. This experience helps us form the basis of the information we will be sharing with you today. We will start by looking at the different forms that limits on liability can take and our experience of these in the market. We will then look at the way limitation and exclusion clauses are used along with a case example showing the importance of fully incorporating them into a contract. We will also look at the constraints that have been put in place to limit the effects of these clauses and the circumstances in which limits on liability can contravene the Unfair Contract Terms Act 1977. We will finish by examining the case of Good Life Foods Limited against Hall Fire Protection Limited to show how exclusion clauses are dealt with in practice. I will now pass you over to Kirsten to take us through the first part of the webinar. Thanks, Lisa. Limitations or the exclusions of liability are not uncommon in construction contracts. In negotiating these, parties to the construction contract have conflicting motives. The consultant, contractor or subcontractor wishes to limit its liability as much as possible whereas the employer wants to maximise its ability to recover damages from the contractor, consultant or subcontractor if they are in breach of contract. In considering a limitation of liability, the employer has to balance protecting the position and ensuring a marketable package against insisting on something that is off-market and which could deter potential contractors or consultants. In practice, there tends to be a commercial compromise so that the employer is still able to recover significant sums from the counterparty, but the counterparty's liability is kept in proportion to the works and the risk of insolvency is minimised. There has been a general trend towards limitations of liability becoming more prevalent and more acceptable to clients and their funders. However, any proposed cap of liability needs to be considered in light of the circumstances surrounding the project, value of the works, marketability of package, etc. Common limitations of liability that we shall consider are limitations in relation to the level of liability, type of losses that can be recovered, time periods that claims can be raised for, other specific exclusions and other factors to be taken into account, for example, liability of other parties with net contribution clauses. One of the most common limitations of liability is a cap on the level of damages that can be recovered. This can be expressed as an aggregate cap covering all losses that arise under that contract and often under all related contracts, so for example collateral warranties, or a cap that applies to each and every claim arising under the contract. It is common that caps on liability are not drafted precisely and therefore it may not be clear which of these caps applies. There is a huge difference between the two. Therefore, it's important to ensure this is worded appropriately. And we've given an example of a clause in the slide which makes it clear that the limitation of liability there is each and every claim. If it was the case it was to be in the aggregate, then that should also be made clear. 
In terms of consultants' appointments, it is common for limitations of liability to be linked to the level of professional indemnity insurance that the consultant is obliged to maintain, with the logic being that in practice, one is unlikely to be able to recover more than the funds available from the insurers, as the consultant may have limited assets. Consultants, however, may seek to limit their liability to a sum lower than their professional indemnity insurance. Our experience is that most well-advised clients will resist this, as will funders, on the basis that they should get the benefits of the PI insurance. Some appointments produced by consultant bodies may limit the liability to, for example, the lower of a certain amount and 10 times the fees. Whilst this may be accepted by some clients, this is not ideal as the level of fees may not bear any relation to the level of losses to be suffered if the consultant has been negligent. Funders will also strongly resist such clauses. In terms of building contracts, the JCT and SBCC contracts do not include an overall limitation of liability, although the traditional and design and build forms do include an option to limit the liability for loss of use, loss of profit, or other consequential losses arising from a breach of the design obligations. This is often linked to the level of professional indemnity insurance that the contractor maintains. It is possible to see an overall cap on liability in an SBCC contract, but this is less common and would need to be added in as a bespoke clause. Where consultants have negotiated a limitation of liability and it's a design and build contract, you may see that cap passed up into the building contract. So for example, if an engineer limits liability to £10 million any one claim, then the contractor may limit liability to £10 million any one claim in relation to claims arising out of the engineering design. NEC contracts include an optional X18 clause, which has different categories of limitation of liability. From an overall limitation of liability, with some limited carve-outs, to subcaps for losses for indirect and consequential losses, loss for damage to a client's property, and liability for design defects. NEC contracts are more common in the market now, and contractors do tend to expect that when NEC is being used, X18 will be incorporated. There is then a discussion to be had as to the level of cap that is agreed. Where the cap is agreed, we quite often see this set at the level of 120% of the total of the prices, i.e. the amount the contractor has been paid, plus a bit extra for increasing costs, professional and some administration costs. The carve-outs from such limitation clauses are also often keenly negotiated so that the client gets the full benefit of any insurance proceeds. Parties often look to either exclude consequential losses altogether or to cap the level of consequential losses. The likes of FIDIC or MF1 tend to restrict liability for indirect or consequential losses to specifically defined categories like delay damages, performance-related damages, etc., which will have caps on them in themselves. One thing to be aware of, however, is that a direct loss is not just the cost of repairing, reinstating the damage. Parties often assume that the likes of loss of profit is an indirect or consequential loss, but this can be a direct loss depending on what has been built. Therefore, if a party wants to exclude loss of profit, this should be made clear, rather than just referring to excluding consequential losses. It may also be the case that the types of losses that can be recovered depends on the party claiming the losses. For example, there may be a restriction on claims by tenants under collateral warranties to the cost of reinstating repairing the damage to property, whereas the employer under the appointment or a funder under a collateral warranty may be able to recover a fuller category of losses. Consultants and contractors may also wish to limit their liability 
so that they're only liable to the extent that they've been negligent, i.e. they may want to exclude liability for fitness for purpose type obligations. NEC contracts have the likes of X15, which states that the contractor is not liable for the defect which arose from its design unless it fails to carry out that design using the skill and care normally used by professionals designing works similar to the works. It is usual for contracts to state a limitation period for raising a claim. And even if a contractual period is not stated, statutes may impose a limitation. Under English law, the Limitation Act 1980 states that the limitation period is six years for breach of contract, or if executed as a deed, 12 years, although parties can agree a shorter period. Whilst these six and 12 year periods have no legal standing in Scotland, due to the fact that parties often carry out works north and south of the border, and insurers advise north and south of the border, it is common to see a 12 year period included in building contracts, appointments, and collateral warranties, with the shorter six year period often encountered in the likes of letters of reliance for reports, which may well have lost much of their use after six years due to changing conditions in the matters being reported on, for example, environmental conditions. We don't have time to consider in detail, but it is also worth noting there is a trend for non-design consultants to exclude liability for design, specification of materials, quality of workmanship, etc. On one level, some of these exclusions can seem fair, but if a consultant is certifying practical completion, then this may not be appropriate, and it is important to consider these in detail and check there's a balance between what one expects a professional consultant to be responsible for in the context of their duties, rather than just a blanket exclusion. There may also be blanket exclusions for pollution, contamination, asbestos, terrorism, etc. Many of these are linked to what insurance is available, and they may well be appropriate in certain circumstances, but they may not, depending on the services that a professional is carrying out for example, an engineer reporting on site conditions. The final category of limitation of liability that I wanted to mention was the net contribution clause. This is a clause that is typically proposed by the insurers of consultants. Indeed, certain architects and insurers are fairly insistent on a net contribution clause of some form being included. I have put up on the slide a common example of such a clause. Under the net contribution clause, where there are two or more professionals appointed to a construction project who are each jointly liable for the same loss or damage, their liability will be limited to the amount apportioned to them by the courts. Without this clause, where parties A and B are liable for the same breach, then the client is entitled to recover 100% of the damages from party A. It is then up to party A to recover a share of the damages from party B. This is particularly important in situations where one party becomes insolvent. Without a net contribution clause, the client could recover the full amount from party A, despite party A having no prospect of reclaiming a share from party B as it is insolvent. Whereas if a net contribution clause is included in the contract and the court finds party B 60% liable, for example, then the client can only recover 40% from party A, as their liability is limited to the amount that party A is responsible for. These are seen by consultants as fair, as otherwise they consider they are taking the risk of insolvency of another consultant, who it is the client that has chosen to appoint them and carried out any necessary checks in relation to covenants. It is, however, also worth bearing in mind that the consultant is not taking on liability for another consultant's breach. They will only be liable if the losses can be proven to have been caused by their breach. However, it may also be the case that another party has also contributed to those losses. Our experience is that clients are not keen on these clauses and funders will strongly resist these. Indeed, some may refuse them outright. If a net contribution clause is to be agreed, then it's important that the clauses are drafted tightly, referring specifically to the parties who it is known are appointed and providing collateral warranties.
and not simply referring to any consultants, contractors, subcontractors, etc. involved in a project. That's obviously looking at it from the employer's perspective and the funder's perspective. If you're a consultant or contractor, then the wider they're drafted, the better. The drafting on the screen is a fairly tightly worded net contribution clause. So in that instance, it is clear who is included within the net contribution clause, the specific categories of architect, civil and structural engineer, etc., being listed. It's also worth noting that in a design and build project, then a net contribution clause and a consultant's appointment are class for warranty. Then the contractor should be excluded to the extent that they're liable for that consultant's design. I'm just um, going to pass back over to Lisa, who's going to um, continue the webinar. Thanks, Kirstine. While limitation and exclusion clauses are a good way of reducing risk, it is important to ensure that these clauses are fully incorporated into the contract. The recent English case of Arcadis Consulting UK Limited against AMEC BSC Limited highlighted this danger. Arcadis was appointed by AMEC to carry out design work on two projects, one of which was a multi-storey car park. The parties had intended to enter into a wider agreement for all of Arcadis' work in the near future. Before this agreement was finalised, Arcadis started working on the car park under a letter of intent. The letter of intent was emailed to Arcadis, along with the wider agreement, a schedule to the agreement, and terms and conditions. Of particular relevance was condition 2A of the terms and conditions, which stated that, the consultant's liability for defective work under the agreement shall be limited to whichever is a lesser of the following. A. The reasonable direct costs of repair, renewal or reinstatement of any part of the subcontract works to the extent that the client incurs such costs. Or B. The sum stated in Schedule 1, which was £610,515. However, the agreement was never finalised and the parties proceeded on the basis of a letter of intent. AMEC then claimed that the works were defective and the car park would need to be demolished and rebuilt to rectify them. AMEC attempted to recover the £40 million costs from Arcadis, who subsequently raised proceedings for a declaration that their liability was limited to £610,515. In 2016, the High Court found that no final agreement had been reached and therefore Arcadis could not rely on Condition 2A. But the Court of Appeal reversed that decision earlier this year and held that, held that the terms and conditions had been incorporated. However, this was a highly contentious point and the High Court's original judgment should not be disregarded. Before their appeal was successful, Arcadis were facing damages of £40 million, having previously believed that their liability was capped at the £610,515. Therefore, parties seeking to rely on a limitation of liability clause need to ensure that it had been clearly incorporated into the contract, even if it's just a temporary contract. The use of limitation clauses is not without its limits. There are statutory restrictions in place that are necessary for ensuring they are not unduly onerous and unreasonable, and therefore unfairly disadvantaging one party who may not have equal bargaining power. Liabilities can be categorised as being either ones you cannot limit under any circumstances or ones that can be limited by a reasonable clause if the Unfair Contract Terms Act 1997 applies, or UPTA for short. If an exclusion or limitation clause contains a liability that cannot be excluded or limited, any clause purporting to do so will be void. However, as we will see later, this does not necessarily mean the rest of the clause is automatically void. UCTA was initially brought about as a protection for consumers, along with the Unfair Terms and Consumer Contracts Regulations 1999. It now applies to all commercial contracts and therefore covers construction contracts. Under Section 2.1 of UCTA, you cannot limit or exclude liability for death or personal injury resulting from negligence. Other loss or damage resulting from negligence, such as damage to property or a financial loss, can be limited if it satisfies the requirements of the UCTA reasonable test. 
This test is set out in Section 11 and is whether the contract term was a fair and reasonable one to be included, having regard to the circumstances which were or ought reasonably to have been known to or in the contemplation of the parties when the contract was made. Of course, determining what is reasonable will change on a case-by-case -case basis and will depend on the facts of a particular case. However, Section 11 states that regard will be had in particular to the resources available for the purpose of meeting the liability should it arise and also whether insurance cover was available. Schedule 2 also provides further guidance on relevant factors. These are, in summary, 1. The strength of the party's bargaining power. 2. Whether the party was induced to accept the term. 3. Whether the party knew or ought reasonably to have known that the term was included. 4. Where the term excludes or limits liability if a condition was not complied with, whether it was likely at the time the contract was made that compliance with that condition would be practicable, and finally, in the case of the sale of goods, whether the goods were made to the special order of the customer. The importance of these factors will become clearer when we look at how the test was applied in the case of Good Life Foods Limited against Hall Fire Protection Limited. However, it should be noted that this list is non-exhaustive. It will depend on the facts of individual cases which factors are relevant for determine, determining reasonableness. We will now look at the recent English case of Good Life Foods Limited against Hall Fire Protection Limited from earlier this year, where the Court of Appeal considered the validity of exclusion clauses in construction contracts. The case will illustrate how the UCTA reasonableness test is applied in practice and the factors the court will take into consideration when determining whether an exclusion clause is applicable. In this case, Good Life Foods Limited appointed Specialist Fire Suppression Contractor Hall Fire Protection Limited to supply and install a fire suppression system in its factory premises in Warrington. Approximately 10 years later, on the 25th of May 2012, a fire broke out in the factory and the system that Hall Fire had supplied and installed failed to suppress it, resulting in around £6.6 .6 million pounds of damage to the property and the business's operation. Good Life argued that the suppress suppression system was defective and consequently raised proceedings against Hall Fire for breach of contract and negligence. The claim for breach of contract was time barred, however the claim for negligence was not, so they proceeded on that basis. Hall Fire's standard terms contained an exclusion clause, which they relied upon in their defence. The clause was as follows. We exclude all liability, loss, damage or expense, consequential or otherwise, caused to your property, goods, persons or the like, directly or indirectly resulting from our negligence or delay or failure or malfunction of the systems or components provided by HFS for whatever reason. In the case of the faulty components, we include only the replacements free of charge for those defective parts. As an alternative to our basic tender, we can provide insurance to cover the above risk. Please ask for the extra cost of provision of this cost if required. So if Hall Fire were able to rely on this clause, it would exclude liability for Good Life's entire claim. The Court of Appeal was asked to consider two main questions in this case. Firstly, whether the exclusion clause was incorporated into the contract, and two, whether the clause was reasonable within the meaning of the Unfair Contract Terms Act. As discussed earlier, if the clause is not properly incorporated into the contract or deemed to be unreasonable, then it is not valid and cannot be relied upon. The court decided in this case that the exclusion clause was incorporated into the contract because it was not unusual and because Hall Fire made the clause clear from the outset by putting it on the front of the quotation in clear writing, thereby drawing it to Good Life's attention. The court also decided that Good Life had plenty of time to take Hall Fire's terms and conditions into consideration before agreeing to them. As such, the clause was deemed to have been incorporated into the contract. The court then looked at the clause's reasonableness for the purposes of UCTA. Firstly, the clause excluded liability for personal injury or death, which contravenes UCTA, thereby rendering it this part of the clause invalid. 
However, the court held that the clause in its entirety could not be deemed automatically invalid because of that part and agreed that the contract had to be look at, looked at as a whole. Applying the UCTA guidance in Schedule 2, which we discussed earlier, the court then looked at the reasonableness of the clause and focused on the broadly equal size and bar bargaining power of the two commercial entities and considered the fact that Good Life were not restricted to Hall fire, fire in their choice of contractor. They could have chosen a contractor who would have agreed to do so on less stringent terms. Good Life received no inducement to agree to the exclusion clause. Also, the court held that there had been adequate allocation of risk due to the clause's reference to the need for insurance against the risk of the system's failure. The court considered this to be an important aspect of the clause to consider when determining its reasonableness. They held that the clause was not reasonable in excluding liability for the majority of damage and loss caused by its defective performance when it was made clear from the outset that if Goodwill was not satisfied with this liability being excluded, then they could take out and pay for insurance after which liability would be accepted. As such, the rest of the exclusion clause was held to satisfy the UCTA reasonableness test and Goodwill's claim for negligence was unsuccessful. One of the main points to take from this case is that the courts will tend not to intervene with contracts ag agreed between commercial entities of equal size and bargaining power and will give weight to freely agreed terms. An exclusion or limitation clause can still be rendered valid even when it is in breach of UCTA. Generally, clauses seeking to exclude all liability are likely to be deemed unreasonable as it puts one party in a largely disadvantaged position, particularly when the parties do not have equal bargaining power. However, this will be less likely when the clause seeks to merely limit or cap liability as it restricts the effects of unfair limits on liability. We've now come to the end of the presentation, which we hope has been useful and interesting. We've still got a few minutes to answer any questions. If you haven't already done so, please type your questions into the chat box now. While you're doing that, I'd like to take this opportunity to inform you that our spring seminars will be taking place in early March next year, details of which will be provided shortly. This webinar has been recorded and will be available on our Vimeo site shortly, so if you know of any colleagues who haven't been able to participate today, or if you think this will be useful for anyone, then please let them know. We will be circulating details of the recording to participants after the webinar. The other two parts of this three-part webinar series are also available on Vimeo. Um, one question which has come up is um, just in relation to whether we consider that um, in terms of a net contribution clause or limitation on liability, what um, would be preferable to a funder. Um, and our experience in relation to that is that um, funders will resist net contribution clauses, um, but limitations of liability, if that is linked um, to the level of professional indemnity insurance that a consultant maintains, um, and if the funder and their monitor are satisfied that that's an appropriate level of professional indemnity insurance, um, taking into account the value of the work, um, then that is usually something um, that, can, that will be accepted. I think that is the last of our questions, and our time's up um, pretty much um, for today anyway. So I hope you've enjoyed the webinar and found it informative and useful. Thanks. <laughs>